As our lives become more entwined with digital assets, ranging from social media accounts and online banking to cherished family photos stored in the cloud, it's crucial to consider what happens to these digital possessions should something happen to you. I'm Hillary Topper, and welcome to Hillary Topper On Air. Today, I have the great pleasure of uh, having Diana Latanzio, a partner at the Russo Law Group, join us today. She's going to guide us through some legal frameworks and tools available to help you manage your digital legacy effectively. Diana, welcome to the show. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you for having me. So can you start by explaining what actually is a digital asset in today's world? Yes, it's a lot more than you realize. Okay, we rely so heavily on technology that digital assets can range from anything that can be monetary. So I'll start with the first grouping. Monetary digital assets are things like Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, e-commerce, um, it, it can be online accounts that you set up um, where maybe it has a higher interest rate, um, higher yield than, you know, regular accounts that you can create at branches. And these are all, are all virtual institutions where you can't walk into a branch, right? Um, so, so that's the first type of uh, digital asset grouping. Um, it can also be an area where you store information. So on your computer, a laptop, a desktop, on your phone, right? So we have so much information that we rely on so heavily on our phones with our apps um, that help us with our banking. Um, it can be your email that has a ton of information, secure information that's sent to us through email. It can be loyalty or reward points. So a lot of people don't realize, right, when you're flying a lot or you have a credit card with JetBlue or Delta and you're accumulating all of these flyer miles and the same thing with booking hotels where you get all of these rewards that you can use, right, that convert to cash, really. Um, those are all digital assets as well, credit cards that you use, that you're generating points that you can link to an Amazon account and cash in for gift cards, or again, just accumulate points where you can purchase things. These are all digital assets. Um, in addition to videos, pictures, very sensitive, you know, family heirlooms and information that you have, um, or online social media, like a Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, these are heavily um, scoped through scammers. And so when someone isn't using the account and it's stagnant for a while or upon someone's death, we see this where it gets hacked and now hackers are accessing, you know, the profile. So we want to make sure that all of these things are protected. Mm. What about like uh, Venmo, PayPal, Zelle? Where would that fall in? Would that fall into your first grouping into banking? It would. Yes, exactly. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. Definitely. That's part of just another asset, right? Where you're yeah. getting money and you're, you know, maybe giving money, getting money. Um, that's definitely linked to a bank account. I know Zelle is linked to a bank account. You know, Venmo can be linked to a bank account or a credit card. Um, so again, that would fall into the first grouping. Interesting. So was there a personal or professional experience that highlighted the importance to you personally about protecting your digital assets that got you involved in this? Uh, I think it's just trend. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, with ongoing, I'm seeing a lot more clients now in their financial portfolio that have a lot of uh, monetary digital assets, a lot of crypto, a lot of Bitcoin. And so their concerns about, you know, leaving the legacy to someone else. And how do we transfer these types of accounts that do not have, you know, like a paper type of uh, transferability, such as a deed or a car or anything that's hard paper. So we had to really, you know, expand our knowledge on this area uh, that's up and coming. And, and with crypto and uh, Bitcoin, you have like a special password key that you can transfer that asset to someone else. 
Um, and, and just in terms of, like I said, a lot of our clients have had their accounts hacked. And so that's when it became really important for us to educate them on securing that, um, have a two-part uh, authentication process for it. Um, try to use you know, your face recognition to open up these apps on your phone. So if you're just leaving your phone somewhere, someone can just pick it up and they'll have access to your accounts, right? Um, so we've seen this happen to some of our clients. And so that's why we started you know, blogging and educating our clients on you know, more protection for these you know, types of secure, not just monetary, but also you, know, you don't want anyone having access to you know, your grandchildren's pictures or your home videos. Right. Um, so it's just becoming an up and coming trend to protect these types of things. And also, you know, what happens, we see it firsthand, what happens if you become incapacitated? How does your family access this information, right? So we've had to incorporate provisions in our advanced directives and our power of attorney, um, because these assets get locked, the phones, the iPhones get locked. And so no one has access to it. Even if you try calling, you know, Apple um, to gain access, they want documentation, right? So we've had to incorporate these provisions into our legal documents that would allow an agent under a power of attorney to have access to all of these assets to shut down a social media page um, or turn it into, you know, a memorial if you pass away um, and access your banking and all of these, you know, types of assets. Um, so it's becoming very prevalent um, based on how technology has uh, invaded our lives, I will say. So, so talk to us a little bit about what people should do. I mean, should they share their, their passwords? I mean, when my parents were alive, they would put all of their passwords in a notebook, which was so not secure. Right. Um, is it that we should share it with our attorney, you know, to let them know. I mean, who who has access to this information? And how do you how do you get it when somebody passes away? So the common issue that we've had is that our clients have created these beautiful spreadsheets, okay, and have, you know, stated on here, like this is my computer password for my computer. This is my iPhone password. But then if you're not sharing that with anyone, it gets locked and we don't have access to the computer to get the information that's in there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do have a form on our website under blogs that you can just type in digital will and it has a spreadsheet that you can use or you can create one similar and then we ask our clients to share that with us we keep it obviously secure and then when it's needed we're able to direct an agent under a power of attorney an executor under a will or a trustee under a trust we can direct them exactly where to look to gain access to all of this information so that's the most secure method that I would recommend. So how do these digital assets differ from traditional physical assets in terms of management and inheritance? It's very similar. Um, so like I said, the, the uh, crypto, Bitcoin, those are a little specific in that you need special protocol, um, you know, when you're creating that account or while you have access. Um, the iPhones and the Androids actually have legacy contacts within the settings. So you can actually go into your phone setting and arrange for a legacy contact that would have automatic access, which is very helpful. Um, so that's what we recommend you know, for those types of accounts. With regard to online bank accounts, it would be the same as, you know, a traditional regular, um, you know, Chase account or anything else where you go into a branch and that once we gain access, then through the document itself, you're stating who you would want that beneficiary to be. And then it's just a matter of paperwork to have that transferred to the appropriate party. Well this is, I mean, it sounds kind of a silly question, but I think it's an important question to ask. Why is it crucial to have these digital assets in your estate plan? Great question. Um, because we want a seamless transition, right? We don't want to have to go through a lot of red tape to get 
our clients' uh, beneficiaries to have access to their parents' videos, pictures, um, you know, just even bank accounts. If we have to maintain liquidity in an estate, we want immediate access. And so that's why now with, you know, the world being, um, you know, so heavily reliant on all of these apps and, and different um, types of services, we want to be able to just have a seamless transition and not have to go through, you know, jump through a lot of, um, you know, hurdles to get there. So is, has this now become a part of the whole estate planning when you meet with someone? I mean, do you get all of this information in addition to all their other information? We do. Needless to say, our questionnaire has uh, doubled in volume because <laughs> now we have an entirely separate section just devoted to this. These are the questions, right? Do you have any, you know, crypto? Do you have um, Bitcoin? Do, do you have these assets now that we need to look into that aren't so obvious, right? So, so usually back in the day, it was easy to assess when someone passed away what their assets were, even if it wasn't spelled out for us, because we did that through the mail. The mm -hmm. mail was our trail to putting this puzzle together, right? So we would see, oh, that well, this statement came from, you know, back then, let's say a story of federal, which doesn't exist anymore. But we would see that and know, okay, this is the account number. So obviously this decedent had an account there. So we're going to start there. Now it's not so easy because most people have moved and, and are, you know, um, interested in saving the environment more conscious that way. And so they're paperless. Everything is paperless. Everything is just sent to an email or you have access, you know, through an online account. And so it's not that easy to piece this puzzle together. So we try to get as much information as we can from our clients when they're coming in, you know, give us an idea of exactly what you own, even if it's not in paper form so that we can help your family identify these assets and ultimately claim them. And like I said, it wasn't so you know prevalent that we had all of these royalty rewards, which can amount to a lot of money, right? And we don't want to lose this. Uh, it could be thousands of dollars that we're collecting. Um, so now it's become a little more challenging on our end, um, but we try to make the process as simple as possible. So how often would you say that someone should update their estate plan with these digital assets? I mean, things change all the time. I mean, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Will there be a different Venmo? Will there be a, you know, a different, you know, place to put your money? I mean, who knows? I mean, every every day something's changing, right? Absolutely. Even with the banks, right? So how many times yeah. did, uh, you know, the, the yeah. turn you can't keep track <laughs> anymore of what... Well, who, who has this bank account anymore? You know, it was a story of federal. Then it was, I think, Webster. Uh, you know, it, it just keeps changing over and over. So um, we say as often as you can, at the very least, once a year. Yeah. So put it in your calendar, just like, you know, New Year's. So sometime in January is a good time mm -hmm. um, that you just calendar it mm -hmm. and you update whatever spreadsheet you have as to what your current assets are, including your digital assets. You try to keep a running list as you accumulate things, but you know that's not always possible. Life is busy. You don't always get to it. But if it's something that you're calendaring in, just like your well check with a doctor, right? So let's say once a year you go get your blood drawn and you, know, you have a well check with your primary care physician. Similarly, you do the same thing. You just calendar it in, um, make an appointment to have a check-in with your attorney to review everything. And, and that helps to keep it up to date. Yeah, it's really important. Well, before we move on, I just have to say I'm so appreciative of our sponsors and must take the time out to thank them. Please support our sponsors and tell them that you heard about them on Hillary Topper on Air. Special thanks to the Russo Law Group, Long Island Signature Estate Planning, Elder Law and Special Needs Law Firm, and Buddha Bath, a natural bath and body care company that offers a wide variety of products, including body butter, bath bombs, soap bars, and sugar scrubs. Now back to you, Diana. So what are the first steps that someone should take to ensure that di digital legacy is secure and accessible to their loved ones? So, um, 
you should have when you're creating these types of uh, digital asset accounts um, to make sure that if it's permissible that you name some type of a legacy contact. Um, obviously, for your crypto Bitcoin, you want your passcode. Um, you know, you can link it to a wallet or you know something where uh, it's it's linked to your phone as well. Uh, with your phones, you want to go to your settings to, and and add in a legacy contact there um, and keep a running list of all of your digital assets for your family members, create a digital will if you can um, and share that with your estate planning attorney. Yeah, that's great advice. Also, can you share any best practices for organizing and documenting these digital assets? I mean, Mine are all over the place. I can't even imagine going through the task of, of kind of organizing them. So wh what would you suggest? So with our digital will format, it has all different types of, um, you know, computer files and phone apps. And so I think it's a really good form for you to use. Um, so that would probably be my recommendation, something, you know, to either yeah. download that for free or create something similar, but it does go through, you know, every different type. Yeah. Um, so that it's kind of like a checklist. So you're not missing mm -hmm. anything. That's great. That's yeah. really great. Okay. So um, now what role do digital executors play in managing digital assets and how can one designate a digital executor. And is this person different than the executor of the will? No, it would be the same person. So um, we just name the executor, we name successors in case, you know, that executor is incapacitated or God forbid, you know, predeceases the testator. Um, and that person that we de designate in the power section of the document, the will, if it's a will or um, in the trust, a trust power provision, in a power of attorney, the power provision, we add specifically an entire list of um, access and authority for digital assets. So it's in the document itself that the person you're appointing has the authority to access this information and or collect, marshal it and distribute it. Um, so it's the same as who you're appointing in the document for all of your other assets as well. That's good to know. And also, do you have any real life experiences or case studies where proper digital estate planning made a significant difference in the, you know, in, in for a family? So it's just basically our day-to-day -day experience. This is pretty up and coming. Um, it's a newer trend. So, you know, I don't have any specific case law I can cite, um, but it just, I can tell you from a practical perspective that it just really does help um, it to expedite the process. Um, so instead of, you know, sometimes what happens is an estate is closed out because we think, mm -hmm. okay, everything is done. We collected everything. So we close it out. And then years later, we come to find out that there was, you know, some online account that no one knew about. And now we have to reopen everything. And it's still possible to do. It's not the end of the world. Um, but it just does come with more work because now we have to go back to the court um, and update, you know, letters of authority from the court in order to now collect this new asset and explain to the court that, no, it's not final. We thought it was, but we missed something. So it's just about, you know, making it a smoother um, process and, and just having it all buttoned up in one shot rather than having to go back and reopening things. That's really what it is. You know, just get it done once the first time um, and distribute everything properly so that we don't have to go back and, you know, have more paperwork because that's really what it is. Absolutely. I, I, I just, it's, it's like a whole new world, right? I mean, yeah. you know how estate planning has changed so much in the last, like, you know, 20 years even. And uh, will continue to, right? It's just constantly evolving. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got this form on your website. Um, and can you talk a little bit about like how people can learn more about the form, about you? about the Russo Law Group, um, yeah, and get in Absolutely. touch with you. 
So everything is pretty much laid out on our website. Um, so if you go to J djrussolaw.com, it has a section for uh, biographies for all of the attorneys here. I'm a partner here, so it has my biography as well. If you're interested in uh, this specific area of digital asset planning, you can go to our blog section, and there are several different tabs um, based on what you're interested. If it's specifically cryptocurrency, if it's you know accessing through iPhones, uh, we have tabs for that. You can just search my digital will and the form will um, populate where you can then download it and print it. Um, and like I said, that document has all different um, sections for social media, cloud storage, banking, online shopping, monthly subscriptions. Uh, so you can use that or modify it, you know, to your preference. It's a lot. It's a lot, a lot of information that, you know, we need to get together, but it is important, really. And if you don't have this information on hand, what happens? Basically, everything gets locked, right? So you can lock yourself out of an app. I know I've done it quite a few times. Mm -hmm. And I rely heavily on the face recognition, which is great for security purposes. But if I then for some reason don't have access to it, or it's not recognizing, um, I need to remember what my passwords are. And so, um, you know, just keep a running list. That's the best advice yeah. that I could give you, you know, Thank just you. keep a running list. This yeah. was really informative, a real eye opener, Diana. So thank you so much for being on the show. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors once more, the Russo Law Group, Long Island Signature Estate Planning Elder Law Special Needs Firm. For more information, go to vjrussolaw.com and Buddha Bath, the natural bath and body care company. For more information, visit buddhabath.net. And last but not least, I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in each week. Thank you. And if you want more information on this show or any other show, you can visit us at hillarytopper.com or you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Alexa, Apple Podcasts, you name it. We're out there. Have a great day and we'll see you next time.